Well, good morning. Glad to be back at Hilltop Bible Chapel to see all the young life here. Uh, you know, children singing is a hard act to follow, but those were great songs. So well fitting for what I want to talk about. And let me first wish you, of course, a happy Thanksgiving. It's Canadian Thanksgiving and it's an important day for many people. And I'm delighted to be with you again on this special Thanksgiving weekend. A little while since I've been here. Glad to see you all. I'm struggling with names, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, and I've got to tell you that giving thanks is an important topic in Scripture. Uh, and, and in fact, this is going to, I'm a retired professor, so I love to teach things. It's going to be a teaching opportunity because we need to learn something. We need to learn to do that every day, constantly responding with what I call a gratitude attitude. I'm going to talk about attitudes, and we need one like that with a gratitude attitude for all the blessings we receive from the Lord. Because scripture, you know what scripture calls us to give thanks, I mean not just on a special weekend, uh, but in fact all the time, and in all circumstances, and that's tough, and I gotta talk about that a little bit. Ephesians 5.20 said this, always, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said also in Thessalonians 1, Thessalonians 15, giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's a, that's a pretty challenging couple of scriptures already in all circumstances. Of course, it is wonderful for us as Christian believers, and if you're not on the side as a Christian believer, we have to talk, because the wonderful thing about Christians, unlike atheists, and we have someone to thank when our children were born. When my first kid showed up, I was so grateful to praise and thank the Lord, and I asked one of my unbelieving friends, who did he thank? You see that the scripture is so clear about this, but, but I recognize that the reality is sometimes it is tough to respond to these scriptures. Giving joyful thanks when unwelcome and devastating events happen, great when good things happen, new life, birth, everything wonderful, but events that bring trouble and sadness into our lives. Many of you met my wife Jane this morning and she's been through a couple of years of constant bereavement and difficulty and, and you think, what am I asking? You know, I've got to tell you a story. I remember early one New Year's morning, this was very early before the roads had been salted and many of you knew my wife, uh, late wife Vivian, now with the Lord, she was driving me to speak at a New Year's conference and as we landed the bend on a country road, suddenly she said, oh, Daddy! And the car was just spinning around on the black ice, and it finished up badly damaged, going the wrong way on its side in a rocky ditch. I mean, thoughts were racing through my head, I'll never make a conference, no cell phone in those days, how can I let them know? Anyway, my new car's wrecked! Will the insurance cover this? <laughs> And I'm not going to get help out here this early in the morning. Oh, man. And so I reached to unclip my seatbelt. And as I put my hand to it, I said, Don't touch that seatbelt until you thank the Lord. I said, Thank the Lord. My car's wet. I'm not going to get to the coast. We're in a real mess. I said, Amy, we're alive. We're not hurt. You thank the Lord. And, I, and I've got to confess it. I'm ashamed to admit it was initially with some hesitancy, I thank the Lord, but I did it. What we're going to learn this morning, we're going to learn how to give thanks to the Lord in a scriptural way for everything and in all circumstances. And I hope when you leave you'll be able to do that. Uh, and certainly I hope you realize afresh this morning you have so much more than the average Canadian might be giving thanks for this Thanksgiving weekend. People who don't know the Lord Jesus are happy to celebrate with their family. But you have so much more. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and, and 1 Timothy 4.4 reminds us, look, 
Everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Now, of course, it is important to give thanks today for Canada, now 150 years old, compared with India, India just a little infant, of course. But we give thanks for freedom and the harvest, and we thank the Lord. It is important to thank the Lord for many blessings that we experience in this country, and political stability, and abundant provision of the necessities of life. It's a nice list. But oh, what I want to say this morning is there's so much more, so much more which Psalm 100 spells out for us. I mean, this is even beyond being thankful for family and that baby and your friends and at my age, even those cute grandchildren. Well, they're grown up now, but they're still a bit cute. I'll have them this Thanksgiving. We'll find out just how cute they are, but beyond that. So let's look at Psalm 100, that key verse in the middle, enter his gates, we had it in the breaking of bread this morning, with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name. We're going to read the whole psalm, it's only five verses, just to remind you, this is called a psalm for giving thanks. Psalm 100 says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs, know that the Lord is God, and we sang that, didn't we? Know that the Lord is God. It's He who made us, not we ourselves. We are His. We are His people. The sheep of His pasture shall enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good, and His love endures forever, His truth through all generations. Let's stay. We're going to go through it. I like to organize it, so we'll do the first two verses under the heading of call for a joyful attitude as we give thanks. That gratitude attitude. Uh, then we're going to miss that central verse till the end. We'll save it, that great verse. Verses 3 and 5 give us some important reasons <coughs> to always feel thankful. And of course the bottom line is, it's the Lord we praise in our thanksgiving. Verse 4. So a call for a joyful attitude. We're going to talk about attitude, reasons, and centrally and fundamentally the Lord. So let's get into this wonderful psalm. The first part is this call for a joyful attitude as we give thanks. The first two verses. And this is a challenge to you to just develop in your life that gratitude and attitude. This First two verses, and remember this, I, I found joy in thinking of this. Do you know, this psalm was in the Lord's hymn. Do you know, as Jesus with his disciples would have sung this joyfully and with gladness. They sang the psalms. And, and in fact, Ephesians 5, which I mentioned, but I'll come back to, reminds us that actually singing like this, singing with a joyful attitude, is part of the evidence of spiritual life. Look at the scriptures, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. See so you can make music from your heart. Always give me thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Psalms, hymns, joy, music. <coughs> and it's directly linked with thanksgiving. You know, for worship to be really meaningful, there must always be an element of joyful thanks to the Lord for all he's done for us in saving us, in giving us the promise of eternal joy and blessing in Christ. But the problem is, of course, singing, singing is like an active demonstration of our inner feelings. And it is sometimes hard to sing like this. Because of difficult circumstances, there will be times when we won't feel very much like singing with joy and gladness. But I want to say right off the bat that if we make the effort to think of the great blessing of knowing God, and we remember the wonderful promises He's given us, even in difficult circumstances, we'll begin again to feel the gratitude that sometimes through circumstances just remains buried in our hearts. And you will find yourself responding in a way this song 
as he calls you to. You see, because in many ways, thankfulness is, is something we can learn. We can learn it by cultivating thoughtfulness, uh, by being mindful. Being mindful is all the rage out there in the world. You go to the, the news agents and the super, supermarket book stands and you'll see specialists from mindfulness. But it, it's talking about all kinds of other things than thinking about the Lord. But mindfulness is important. And learning to be thankful is important. Of course, many parents spend a lot of time trying to teach their young children thankfulness. So they give these constant reminders. This child gets a toy in the toy store, and what does mother say? Well, what do you say? We all say, well, what do you say? And, you know, it's prompting them. I remember once, my kids are growing up now, but we had some fun as they were growing up. And I remember once, uh, and my son said, Pastor Gravy. Uh, and I said, hey, what's the magic word? So he said, abracadabra. <laughs> Well, listen, thanks is a word that opens doors as well. I was telling a friend of mine uh, and what my son had said, and he, he said, oh, I said, that's nothing. He said, my daughter wants to ask me to pass the potatoes, but I responded, saying, what do you say? And she said, no. <laughs> pass the potatoes now. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we have a little ways to go. But you know, if you do spend time being mindful, thinking about all God's gifts given through Christ, you can learn without prompting to be thankful with genuine thankfulness that, that actually becomes a normal thing for you, not an automatic response. I know that you can sit at the table and say, oh, someone give thanks and we go over and give thanks. There's out of habit, but I'm talking about something that comes from the heart, not the lips. And of course, this morning we had a, a wonderful time remembering the Lord, the breaking of bread, and we saw that bread and wine on the table, and that's an obvious example, you, because you can't look thoughtfully at the table and think what the bread and wine symbolize. If you think about that, if you're mindful, you'd be compelled to say, thank you, Lord. And that's what we did, and that's what happens. And the Lord's pleased about that. You see, remember the Lord is interested in us giving thanks. Remember that story of the ten lepers, Luke 17? There was a question the Lord asked in, in verse 17 of Luke 17 about the lepers, the ten lepers he healed, and it makes clear the importance that the Lord attaches to our thanks. He said, what the Ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? See, it's all too easy to take God's blessings for granted. Certainly, most unbelievers take the gifts for the glory given. Many Canadians this weekend are giving thanks for all kinds of things, but not looking to the giver. You remember Paul's response, a great deal of statement he made in 2 Corinthians 9.15 about the gift of life in Christ. <coughs> he saw it so immense he couldn't describe it. And he said, it's, it's indescribable. Don't expect me to put it into words this morning. But he said, your response is no. Thanks. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So that's my challenge, first challenge. Do you need to be more active in cultivating the habit of mindfulness? You see, I, I realize how many of the um, simple blessings of everyday life I took for granted when a number of years ago, when I was going to celebrate the birth of a grandchild, so this was a while back, when my daughter was a missionary in the Philippines, I visited the squatter areas in Manila. It was this, this one I'm showing you now was a, was a palace compared to many that we saw. It makes some of those places in Bombay look like palaces, but some of those squatter areas. But you know, when I came back, 
My wife wondered what was going on because I had to flush the toilet to say praise the Lord. Because when I got home, there was always water in the tank before I had to fill it with soapy water for the washing bowl. And I was thanking God for good plumbing and clean water. So this is the challenge. I mean, ask yourself on this Thanksgiving Sunday how much the verses 1 and 2 describe your approach to worshiping the to responding to the Lord, to serving the Lord. And if the answer in your heart is not so much, then you will ask the Lord to help you to be better able. He was saying, that was a great song, count your blessings, name them one by one. I love that song because it forces you to think and see the many great things God has given us and we see them more clearly. And then, of course, as you're approaching it, will be with more enthusiasm, more joy, more gladness as you shout his praise. And there are reasons for that. Now, let's get into verses 3 and 5, the next section of the psalm, which gives us reasons to be okay. What does verse 3 say in terms of the reasons we did that? Well, it says it's because of our relationship with God. This is, this is number one reason, and it describes that. It said, well, he's God and creator, but more than that, he's our shepherd. And we've got to discuss it. He's God and the creator. You know, I've spent most of my adult life on university campuses in, in Britain and in Canada, and over the years I've talked to so many colleagues and students, and I always try to find out what it is that stops them believing in God and trusting God. And I want to share the top two reasons this morning. Number one, the top two things that kept people from trusting God. Number one was God's invisibility. I can't see God. I'll believe it when I see it. Type of business. And then others thought that science, and many of you know I was a professor of chemistry and a scientist, and they thought science gives a more credible explanation for life. I want to deal with this quickly this morning because uh, we, we need to realize the reality of the Lord we can. Because regarding number one, you know that invisible doesn't mean non-existence. I mean, it only takes a minute's thought to realize that because things can't be seen, it doesn't mean they're not real. Even physical things are often invisible. Uh, the girls on the front row can see this. What's in there? Yeah, but what is it? You can't see anything in there, but you know it's air. Life sustaining air. Life air that keeps us alive. You can certainly feel it. You know, you're looking sleepy for Thanksgiving. We can take a deep breath. Come on. <laughs> can you feel it? You feel it. You, you could see it's a mess. Why do you think this paper flutters down? It doesn't drop like a storm. I don't know what my air is. It's just we won't turn it into a physics class. But you see, it's real. And when it comes to non-physical things, but real things like love and the mind and the human will, not just brain and blood, the physical stuff, well, in science, that's generally a world of mystery and speculation. But in the Bible, the Apostle John recognizes the problem of God's invisibility and he opens his gospel by addressing it. And right there in the first chapter at Kivas, he admits no one's ever seen God at any time. But his only son, the one at the Father's side, he has made him known. So clear. And Paul acknowledged it in 1 Timothy. He said, well, God lives in an approachable life. No one has seen, no one can see. And of course, we already had earlier, there are two reasons for this. Two reasons why we can't see God the Father. God's the Spirit. He has no physical body to observe. God the Father, we won't see that, but there's an important reason. That's why we need Jesus and the cross. God's holy. God's holy. So we who are all sinners, there's no question about that, we can't look at him and survive. Now, of course, none of this means that God wants to remain unknown or inaccessible. In fact, that big picture in the Bible is a story of God's efforts to show himself to us, to reveal himself. And the most basic fact in the Christian message, again in the first chapter of John, is the word as Jesus Christ became flesh 
and dwelt among them. What we saw, we saw his glory. So don't worry about invisibility. The reality of God is clear. But what about this business of science having a more credible explanation for that? I can't talk about this in detail, we've done it other times, way back in Bethany days, a long time ago, but let me simply say that for some 50 years, I've followed the efforts of biochemists working hard to create even the simplest forms of life, and I've watched it for 50 years, and these are the best brains in science, and it's without success. But of course, many of these scientists presuppose there is no God, so they don't check the evidence, and they finish up claiming it's credible to believe that chance was able to do what the combined efforts of the best brains in science have been unable to do. So they happily believe that brains evolved without any intelligence behind the process, just blind natural forces and chance. Now I can't go into all the evidence this morning, but many of the convincing evidence of God's power are seen in science and nature. Because this universe contains over a hundred billion galaxies, each with billions of stars like our sun. But that fine tune to make life possible, if this was a science class, we'd go through all those constants and show how everything has to be just right, finely tuned for life. But we're just going to say this morning that our little warm, wet nature in the universe, Earth, is placed perfectly in relation to the sun and the moon so we can enjoy life comfortably on this life-sustaining and beautiful Earth. No wonder Isaiah said, look, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these things? He who brings out the starry host, billions one by one, and calls each by name. Because of his great power, his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So don't let that disturb you. Listen, as a scientist, I have to conclude that God is the only sufficient cause for the universe. And it's much more credible than believing nothing produces everything, that non-life produces life, that randomness produces fine-tuning, that chaos produces information, that unconsciousness produces consciousness, that non-reason produces reason. When you see it, you recognize this as nonsense. And I was thankful you should be this morning that Paul, oh, he said in Romans 1, 20, hey, God's invisible, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so are we there is. Forget those excuses. If you give thanks this morning, if you're a Christian, if you found the right way around his heart, seeing is believing. That's what they, these guys keep saying to me. It's believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. And you give thanks to the Lord. If you've experienced the most compelling evidence of all, if you don't know one bean of science, it's God's transforming presence in your life. If God has guided you and answered your prayers and given you a peace and given you a purpose in life with the assurance of your eternal destiny, that's the best evidence. Because really in the end, that's the bottom line. Whether or not you know or understand any science, because everyone who knows God through Jesus Christ can joyfully testify to the truth of the gospel in a personal way, and you can go up there and not... You might not know about randomness and fine-tuning and all that stuff, and you can say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. You see, what we're talking about in giving your personal testimony is the way you have personally experienced your relationship with God. And you've experienced that because he's not just God the Creator. What does Psalm 100 say? He is wonderful. A shepherd who cares for his sheep. Still in verse 3, is the Lord's creator God, but his shepherd. It says, we're the sheep of his pasture. And the reason you need to personally give thanks to the Lord this weekend and every day is because God revealed, the God revealed through Jesus Christ is not some mysterious force behind the universe. Physicists say to me, well, there must be something behind it. No, it's a God who not only created you for who you are, but called you where you are, and he called you to follow him, just like she, follow a shepherd. 
And do you remember what Jesus said? When Jesus talked about being our shepherd, he made it very personal. I know Jesus in John 10 said this, verse 3, My sheep hear my voice. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name, like the stars call by name, and leads them out. And he said in verse 14, Look, I'm a good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. That's the relationship. It's so personal. You know, way back in another part of Isaiah 49, 15, it said, our name is on the palms of his hands. That's a little allegory, but you know, it's nailed there. Because those palms were nailed to the cross so that we could have a relationship. And you need to give your personal thanks to the Lord today for the wonderful truth of the Christian gospel, that he is the good shepherd, that he gave his life for the sheep. And because Christ gave his life to reconcile you to God, you can know him in an intimate and in a personal way as the one who knows you by name. Some of you are Indian names. I have a real trouble with that. You've got to help me sometimes. You have elaborate names. God doesn't have any problems. He knows your name. Uh, so take seriously what the Lord says. I mean, really take it seriously because he wants to talk to you individually before you listen. Okay. Because he guides your life on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. I'm, so, I'm so old now, I could... Mind you, be here all week if I told you stories. I mean, I can't tell you my age, but I can tell you every year since I found Jesus, I've been all his guidance and leading, and I'd like to give you a testimony, but there is a time, so I'm asking you, when you open your Bible, do you take time to let God speak personally to you? Some men do and women do these elaborate Bible studies, but, but they're not really listening for God to speak personally. You need to wait mindfully in faith, and that will ensure you hear God's voice. As you consciously listen to his word, and, and take time to consider the things that are happening in your life. Because he tries as a shepherd to faithfully guide us all through life's journey. Even though like sheep, you were prone to wander. You've got a sinful preacher this morning who wanders around. But he's a shepherd who follows. And just like a shepherd, he, he, he guides us through life's whole journey. And do you remember this about life's journey? Remember a journey only becomes a journey once you're clear about the destination. If you don't know where you're going, it's endless wandering. You know, when Christopher Columbus came to this continent, discovered North America, when he set out, he didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. When he got home, he didn't know where he was being. <laughs> and we can live like that. The Lord promises a destination. So think about that. Now, I've got to move quick. Man, this time flies on Thanksgiving Day. More reasons to give thanks. Verse 5. It's not only because of our relationship with God, it's because of his character. What does it say? It's good, he's loving and merciful, he remains faithful and eternally true. Because of that, our God, doesn't that what you want to thank this morning? But I know some of you saying, ah, oh, but. You, you said about troubles. Listen, I know some of you are thinking, look, with so much trouble and sadness in this broken world, you don't know about my life. Bereavement, job loss, cancer, all the stuff that comes, it's sometimes really hard to give things. You think of the recent weather-related devastation, earthquakes, flooding, the Caribbean islands, Asia, Mexico, Florida, Puerto Rico, it's a long list and all those refugees fleeing and, and many people are questioning God's goodness and God's love and God's faithfulness. And I want to tell you this morning, it's so important to remember that the Lord Jesus warned us in this broken, fallen world as we get to the end times because of human folly and sin that we'd have trouble. He said in John 16, in the world you will have trouble. Thankfully, he said, but take heart, I will come to but I want to tell you this morning on Thanksgiving Day that Scripture recognizes suffering and trials as a normal expectation for Christians. Peter said, look, he said in 1 Peter 4, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal, or 
ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange will happen to you. In other words, he's saying, very trials and difficulties, they're what early Christians saw as a norm, not an exception. No Christian is exempt from the cause and effect principle so that grief and painful challenges and significant trials continue to beset us as part of the reality of life and especially as you grow old. I can hardly raise my arm this morning. It's a good job I'm not charismatic too much because I, you know about aches and pains, dislocated shoulders. This stuff comes. But you know, it's only the comfy, pain-free ride that believers in Canada enjoy that makes us think that trouble's a strange exception. You talk to some of your colleagues in India about persecution, so different. And there's a classic, you know, it was a common experience in the Bible. It's a classic example, I want to do quickly, of, of, of this in it. Jeremiah, in Lamentations, made a sad lament. He was utterly downcast. But I want you to notice, he found hope by calling to mind the faithfulness of God. Let me remind you, Lamentations 3, Jeremiah says, I remember my afflictions, and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. My soul is downcast within me. He said, yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The one thing the unbeliever doesn't have, we have hope. Therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. And then that great song we sing about God's faithfulness. This is the context. Be on you every morning, great is your faithfulness. But I want you to notice what Jeremiah did in his sadness and despair. He called to mind. He made an effort to remember God's great love and faithfulness. And how God has shown his concern, making his presence known every day. He was mindful. Such a reminder that morning prayer and a quiet time are so helpful in recognizing his real presence, expressing thanks, not just on this one special weekend. You see, because hope came to Jeremiah when instead of brooding on his walls, he changed his focus and he thought about God's character. God's character is a loving and faithful God, and that gave him hope. So I'm saying to you this morning, in your difficulties, and I know many of you have difficulties, rest on what you know about God from his word. Because knowing God's character, you'll soon realize that you can always safely trust him. Let me repeat verse 5 again. What's God's character? He's good. He's loving. He's forever faithful. So the bottom line, in the last five minutes, is simply verse 4. It's the Lord we praise in thanksgiving. And that's what makes it possible in all circumstances. Because God is always true to himself. God's immutable. God's consistent. God cannot, will, or do anything that would deny his character. And you can trust him. The good, loving, merciful God, whose unchanging truth endures forever. The psalm says, through all generations, God's faithful. And he will accomplish his plans for you. Surely you can thank the Lord for that. I've got to tell you, and, and, and this is practical advice. Some of us think, you've got to pray these elaborate prayers. There's no prayer that's too small. There's only a small perspective about God. That's why I'm telling you about his character. If you have the right perspective about God, the smallest prayer is a prayer he hears because he listens. He's a shepherd. And my advice to you if you're struggling to give thanks this weekend is whenever you feel overwhelmed with loss and trials, and I've known that in our home, you find small things to be grateful for and thoughtfully dwell on them. And because of that, because you completely, can completely rely on them, you can still give thanks and praise to him, whatever your present circumstances may be. We've mentioned this chorus already. Just remember this great chorus. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. You see, that's one big thing. I talked about the small things. Call to mind the small things. That's one big thing for which you can be eternally grateful.
You will be eternally grateful. And if God's not saved at all because you don't know the Lord Jesus, you grab Andrew, one of the elders here, or talk to us. Because that's something in all circumstances and all times you can give thanks. So what I'm going to ask you to, and, and I pray that as we do this, that the Lord will enable you this week and in your life to live out verse 4 and give thanks to him. And enter his course with thanksgiving and his presence with praise, giving thanks to him and praising his name. I'm going to ask, and maybe Andrew, if you can help us, to sing this chorus together. We're going to sing it twice. Thank you, Lord. And you can do that in all circumstances because he saved your soul. Andrew, let us go with his song. Thank you, Lord. All together. Lord,